Hi, welcome for chapter four of The Outsiders by S.E. Hinton. The park was about two blocks square with a fountain in the middle and a small swimming pool for the little kids. The pool was empty now in the fall, but the fountain was going merrily. Tall elm trees made the park shadowy and dark, and it would have been a good hangout, but we preferred our vacant lot. And the shepherd outfit liked the alleys down by the tracks, so the park was left to lovers and little kids. Nobody was around at 2.30 in the morning, and it was a good place to relax and cool off. I couldn't have gotten much cooler without turning into a popsicle. Johnny snapped up his jeans jacket and flipped up the collar. Ain't you about to freeze to death, pony? You ain't a woofin', I said, rubbing my bare arms between drags on a, my cigarette. I started to say something about the film of ice developing on the outer edges of the fountain when a sudden blast from a car horn made us both jump. The blue Mustang was circling the park slowly. Johnny swore under his breath and I muttered, what do they want? This is our territory. What are so Socha's doing this far east? Johnny shook his head. I don't know, but I bet they're looking for us. We picked up their girls. Oh, glory, I said with a groan. This is all I need to top off a perfect night. I took one last drag on my weed and ground the stub under my heel. Want to run for it? It's too late now, Johnny said. Here they come. Five socias were coming straight at us, and from the way they were staggering, I figured they were reeling pickled. That scared me. A cool, deadly bluff could sometimes shake them off, but not if they outnumbered you five to two and were drunk. Johnny's hand went to his back pocket, and I remembered his switchblade. I wished for that broken bottle. I'd sure show them I could use it if I had to. Johnny was scared to death. I mean it. He was as white as a ghost, and his eyes were wild-looking, like the eyes of an animal in a trap. We backed against the fountain and the socias surrounded us. They smelled so heavily of whiskey and English leather that I almost choked. I wished desperately that dairy and soda would come along hunting for me. The four of us could handle them easily, but no one was around. And I knew Johnny and I were going to have to fight it out alone. Johnny had a blank, tough look on his face. You'd have had to know him to see the panic in his eyes. I stared at the socias coolly. Maybe they could scare us to death, but we'd never let them have the satisfaction of knowing it. It was Randy and Bob and three other socias, and they recognized us. I knew Johnny recognized them. He was watching the moonlight glint off Bob's rings with huge eyes. Hey, what do you know? Bob said a little unsteadily. Here's the little greasers that picked up our girls. Hey, greasers. You're out of your territory, Johnny warned in a low voice. You'd better watch it. Randy swore at us and they stepped in close. Bob was eyeing Johnny. Nup, pal, you're the ones who'd better watch it. Next time you want a broad, pick up your own kind. Dirt. I was getting mad. I was hating them enough to lose my head. You know what a greaser is, Bob asked white trash with long hair. I felt the blood draining from my face. I've been cussed out and sworn at, but nothing ever hit me like that did. Johnny Cake made a kind of gasp and his eyes were smoldering. You know what a soch is, I said, my voice shaking with rage. White trash with mustangs and madras. And then, because I couldn't think of anything bad enough to call them, I spit at them. Bob shook his head, smiling slowly. You could use a bath, greaser, and a good working over, and we've got all night to do it. Give the kid a bath, David. I ducked and tried to run for it, but the soch caught my arm and twisted it behind my back and shoved my face into the fountain. I fought, but the hand at the back of my neck was strong, and I had to hold my breath. I'm dying, I thought, and wondered what was happening to Johnny. I couldn't hold my breath any longer. I fought again desperately, but only sucked in water. I'm drowning, I thought. They've gone too far. A red haze filled my mind, and I slowly relaxed. 
The next thing I knew, I was lying on the pavement beside the fountain, coughing water and gasping. I lay there weakly, breathing in air and spitting out water. The wind blasted through my soaked sweatshirt and dripping hair. My teeth chattered unceasingly and I couldn't stop them. I finally pushed myself up and leaned against the fountain, the water running down my face. Then I saw Johnny. He was sitting next to me, one elbow on his knee and staring straight ahead. He was a strange greenish white and his eyes were huger than I'd ever seen them. I killed him, he said slowly. I killed that boy. Bob, the handsome Soch, was lying there in the moonlight, doubled up and still. A dark pool was growing from him, spreading slowly over the blue-white cement. I looked at Johnny's hand. He was clutching his switchblade, and it was dark to the hilt. My stomach gave a violent jump, and my blood turned icy. Johnny, I managed to say, fighting the dizziness, I think I'm going to be sick. Go ahead, he said in the same steady voice. I won't look at you. I turned my head and was quietly sick for a minute. Then I leaned back and closed my eyes so I wouldn't see Bob lying there. This can't be happening. This can't be happening. This can't be. You really killed him, huh, Johnny? Yeah, his voice quavered slightly. I had to. They were drowning you, Pony. They might have killed you. And they had a blade. They were going to beat me up. Like, I swallowed. Like they did before. Johnny was quiet for a minute. Yeah, he said. Like they did before. Johnny told me what had happened. They ran when I stabbed him. They all ran. A panic was rising in me as I listened to Johnny's quiet voice go on and on. Johnny, I nearly screamed, what are we going to do? They put you in the electric chair for killing people. I was shaking. I want a cigarette. I want a cigarette. I want a cigarette. We had smoked our last pack. I'm scared, Johnny. What are we going to do? Johnny jumped up and dragged me by my sweatshirt. He shook me. Calm down, pony boy. Get a hold of yourself. I hadn't realized I was screaming. I shook loose. Okay, I said, I'm okay now. Johnny looked around, slapping his pockets nervously. We got to get out of here. Get somewhere. Run away. The police will be here soon. I was trembling, and it wasn't all from cold. But Johnny, except for the fact that his hands were twitching, looked as cool as Derry ever had. We'll need money, and maybe a gun, and a plan. Money? Maybe a gun? A plan? Where in the world will we get those, these things? Daly, Johnny said with finality. Daly will get us out of here. I heaved a sigh. Why hadn't I thought of that? But I never thought of anything. Dallas Winston could do anything. Where can we find him? I think at Buck Merrill's place. There's a party over there tonight. Daly said something about it this afternoon. Buck Merrill was Daly's rodeo partner. He was the one who'd got Daly the job as a jockey for the slash, slash day. Buck raised a few quarter horses and made most of his money on fixed races and a little bootlegging. I was under strict orders from both Dairy and Soda not to get caught within 10 miles of his place, which was dandy with me. I didn't like Buck Merrill. He was a tall, lanky cowboy with blonde hair and buck teeth. Or he used to be bucktooth before he had the front two knocked out in a fight. He was out of it. He dug Hank Williams. How gross can you get? Buck answered the door when we knocked. A roar of cheap music came with him. The clinking of glasses, loud, rough laughter, and female giggles, and Hank Williams. It scraped on my raw nerves like sandpaper. A can of beer in one hand, Buck glared down at us. What do you want? Daly, Johnny gulped, looking back over his shoulder. We got to see Daly. He's busy, Buck snapped, and someone in his living room yelled, aha, and then yeehaw, and the sound of it almost made my nerves snap. Tell him it's Pony and Johnny, I commanded. 
I knew Buck, and the only way you could get anything from him was to bully him. I guess that's why Dallas could handle him so easily. Although Buck was in his mid-twenties and Daly was 17. He'll come. Buck glared at me for a second, then stumbled off. He was pretty well crocked, which made me apprehensive. If Daly was drunk and in a dangerous mood, he appeared in a few minutes, clad only in a pair of low-cut blue jeans. Scratching the hair on his chest, he was sober enough, and that surprised me. Maybe he hadn't been there long. Okay, kids, what do you need me for? As Johnny told him the story, I studied Daly, trying to figure out what there was about this tough-looking hood that a girl like Cherry Valence could love. Toe-headed and shifty-eyed, Daly was anything but handsome. Yet, in his hard face, there was character, pride, and a savage defiance of the world. He could never love Cherry Valence back. It would be a miracle if Daly loved anything. The fight for self-preservation had hardened him beyond caring. He didn't bat an eye when Johnny told him what had happened, only grinned and said, good for you, when Johnny told him how he knifed the soche. Finally, Johnny finished. We figured you could get us out if anyone could. I'm sorry we got you away from the party. Aw, shoot, kid. Daly glanced contemptuously over his shoulder. I was in the bedroom. He suddenly stared at me. Glory, put your... Boy, but your ears can get red, pony boy. I was remembering what usually went on in the bedroom at Buck's parties. Then Daly grinned in amused realization. It wasn't anything like that, kid. I was asleep or trying to be with all this racket, Hank Williams. He rolled his eyes and added a few adjectives after Hank Williams. Me and Shepard had a run in and I cracked some ribs. I just needed a place to lay over. He rubbed his side ruefully. Old Tim sure can pack a punch. He won't be able to see out of one eye for a week. He looked us over and sighed. Well, wait a sec, and I'll see what I can do about this mess. Then he took a good look at me. Pony boy, are you wet? Yes, I stammered through chattering teeth. Glory hallelujah. He opened the screen door and pulled me in, motioning for Johnny to follow. You'll die pneumonia before the cops ever get you. He half dragged me into an empty bedroom, swearing at me all the way. Get the sweatshirt off. He threw a towel at me. Dry off and wait here. At least Johnny's got his jeans jacket. You ought to know better than to run away in just a sweatshirt. And a wet one at that. Don't you ever use your head? He sounded so much like dairy that I stared at him. He didn't notice and left me sitting on the bed. Johnny lay back on it. Wish I had me a weed. My knees were shaking as I finished drying off, sitting there in my jeans. Daly appeared after a minute. He carefully shut the door. Here, he handed us a gun and a roll of bills. The gun's loaded, for Pete's sake, Johnny. Don't point the thing at me. Here's 50 bucks. That's all I could get out of Merrill tonight. He's blowing his loot from that last race. You might have thought it was Daly who fixed those races for Buck, being a jockey and all, but it wasn't. The last guy to suggest it lost three teeth. It's the truth. Daly rode the ponies honestly and did his best to win. It was the only thing Daly did honestly. Pony, do Dairy and Soda Pop know about this? I shook my head. Daly sighed. Boy, howdy. I ain't inching to be the one to tell Dairy and get my head busted. Then don't tell him, I said. I hated to worry Soda Pop and would have liked to let him know I had fallen this far gotten this far okay, but I didn't care if Derry worried himself gray-headed. I was too tired to tell myself I was being mean and unreasonable. I convinced myself it would be fair to make Daly tell him. Let me get a little bit bigger for myself. <laughs> um, it wouldn't be fair to make Daly tell him. Derry would beat him to death for giving us the money and the gun and getting us out of town. Here, Daly handed me a shirt about 60 million sizes too big. It's bucks. You and him ain't exactly the same size, but it's dry. He handed me his worn brown leather jacket with the yellow sheep's wool lining. It'll get cold where you're going, but you can't risk being loaded down with blankets. I started buttoning up the shirt. It about swallowed me. Hop the 315 freight to Windricksville. Daly instructed. There's an old abandoned church on top of Jay Mountain. 
There's a pump in back, so don't worry about water. Buy a week's supply of food as soon as you get there. This morning, before the story gets out. And then don't so much as stick your noses out the door. I'll be up there as soon as I think it's clear. Man, I thought New York was the only place I could get mixed up in a murder rap. At the word murder, Johnny made a small noise in his throat and shuddered. Daly walked us back to the door, turning off the porch light before we stepped out. Get going, he messed up Johnny's hair. Take care, kid, he said softly. Sure, Daly, thanks. And we ran into the darkness. <clears throat> I'm going to pause this video here and you can come back for part two of chapter four.